to ask me questions during the talk rather than at the end of the talk. So the question is for me, for you is, um, do you, I, would you be responsible for reading the, the, the questions from the chat and reading them out loud? Or would you want me to be looking at the chat and reading them? Looking at the chat? So you, you, you thinking that you, you're gonna, you want to interact with the audience during yes. the yes. Yes. People ask questions in the chat, right? In chat room. Yes. Chat board. So, uh, do, do you do you want me to 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 read the chat, or will you be reading the chat for me? Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, I I recommend you read out the chat the text right written on the chat room, and uh, you answer to the question or talk. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, sounds good. So just just monitor the chat chat board. Sounds good. Mm. And you, uh, let me check what your name. Your name is Ram. Ra Ram Ram, Ram Rahum. Yeah. Ram Rahum. Ram Rahum. And say your name again, please. My name is Yosuke. 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 Or the chair is okay. Chairman, chair. I'm chairman. Okay, so it's yeah. So yeah, the preparation time is okay. Yeah, it's fine. So just keep relaxed before start. Turn off the Ooh. mic, or it's okay to turn off the uh, slide. はい、それではこれからラムラフムさんの発表を始めさせていただきます。タイトルは、Why Snoop Never Use Print for Debugging Again です。発表時間は質疑を含んで30分です。発表前にマイクテストを兼ねてスピーカーに読み上げ事項を読み上げていただきます。Okay, now we are going to start Ram Rafum's presentation. The title is Pi Snooper Never Use Print for Debugging Again. Yes. Ram Raham have 30 minutes. Uh, before, we, before the presentation, the speaker will read the paper for a microphone test. Okay, Ram Sam, please read out the, the paper. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ram Rahum. The title of my presentation is Pi Snooper Never Use Print for Debugging Again. This presentation will be in English and the materials are also in English. I will publish the presentation materials. I agree to having my picture taken during my presentation and I will comply with the PyCon JP code of conduct. Thank you very much. Sound is clear. So please share your screen. Yeah, screen is also fine. So, okay, let's start. Please welcome Mr. Ram Sans with big crowds. Thank you. Hi, everybody. And uh, good afternoon in Japan. This is the uh, Amre Ram and I'm speaking from Tel Aviv, Israel, where it is morning. And my talk is gonna be about PySnooper. PySnooper is an open source project that I've developed. It's a, it's a debugging tool. 
And in this talk, I'm going to tell you all about it, everything you might, that might interest you. Um, so PySnooper is an open source project that, that I created. I'm going to tell you about myself and I'm going to tell you about PySnooper. But first, first, I want to brag that it's been one of my most uh, successful ones. Here is uh, the project on, on GitHub. Here's the, the GitHub page. And you can see that, you can see that um, the project got many, many stars. There are 13,000 stars. Lots of people visited this repo. And I, I released it a year and a half ago. And it really amazed me to see how many people uh, really liked this repo and started it and forked it and shared it and tweeted about it. And I got lots of contributors. I have like 23 contributors. So I'm going to tell you all about it. And I'll, after after describing the solution itself, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about making an, a popular open source project. Uh, but first about myself. Uh, my name is Ram. Uh, I'm a long time Python developer. Uh, I've uh, I'm known mostly for my big open source projects, without, which are PySnooper and Python Turtle. I've contributed to a bunch of big projects like CPython, Django, PyPy, Matplotlib, and others. I do Python workshops. I, I organize PyWebIL, which is the, the Israeli Python community. And I'm, I'm a member of the PSF and the EuroPython Society. See, uh, Yosuke, I see you raising your hand. You, you want to say anything? No, no, no. I'm, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Cool. I, I forgive you. Um, feel free, so feel free to ask questions during the talk, everybody. If you, have, if you have questions, if you have anything that's unclear, feel free to ask them in the chat and I'm going to see that and I'm going to answer your questions. So really feel free to interrupt me in the middle. So here are a few, a few things I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about uh, debugging with a classic debugger. I'm going to talk about why people use uh, print statements and log statements for debugging. I'm going to talk about how PySnooper is a compromise between these two things. Uh, I'm going to talk about how to use PySnooper to debug your code. I'm going to talk about how to make your open source project popular. And I'm going to also show another debugging tool called PUDB. Okay, so let's get started. So before I explain about PySnooper, I'm going to, I'm going to, talk a little bit about classic debuggers. Okay, so this is my debugger, it's called Wing IDE. You have probably never seen it before, but you probably know, you probably know PyCharm. So it is the same thing as PyCharm, just a different brand. And here, here I have a piece of code. Now I'm debugging, which means, which means that, that let's say there is a bug in my code and I want to figure out what's happening. And I'm looking at my code and it seems like it should be doing the right thing, but it's not, there is a bug. So I want to understand what's going on. And I really love to use a classic debugger. So now, okay, first I'll explain about this code. This is just a simple function that I found online. And what, what it does is it takes a number and it converts it to bits, right? So for example, now I gave it the number six and it's conver converting it to, bi to bits, to binary, which, which means 110. Here's the output, 110. So let's say I, want, I wanted to debug this program. So I could put a breakpoint right here, for example, then I would run the program, and then the debugger would stop on that line. And then I could go forward. And, and when I go forward, I can al always use the debug probe to check the value of variables. I can see that the variable number is equal to three, the variable remainder is equal to zero. I can step through the code, really see what's going on, it's super comfortable. I can step into functions, step out of functions. I can set conditional breakpoints. I can set watch expressions, do all kinds of fancy debugger stuff. So I really love to use debuggers. I think they are very convenient. Um, but when I started working with Python professionally, I found that so many people don't really use these kind of debuggers. I mean, people use PyCharm, but they usually don't use the, the, the debugger of PyCharm. And for me, this was very, very surprising because this is, I mean, this is such an awesome tool. I mean, why would people use it? And the, the answer to that question is that, I mean, debuggers look simple when you're working on just a simple file on your computer. But if you work for a big company and you're, you're working on a serious project, there are maybe hundreds of Python files and they are in a project that is convoluted and that is not run in, on your computer, but, but on a separate computer or in a Docker container or on a VM or in a different country or on a different operating system. And it's tough to get the debugger to connect to that kind of setup. It is possible, I've done it. It's possible both, both for Wing IDE and for PyCharm, but, but it requires a lot of setup and most people don't want to spend the time doing that setup. 
So what mo most people, most professional Python developers end up doing when they debug is something like this. Okay, I just put a bunch of print statements in the code. And now if I were to run the code, now when I, when I run the code, uh, I see that the text, there is a text of entering loop and loop run and loop run. And I know the loop ran three times and then, then ended. And then I can add stuff to these print statements. For example, I can say, I want to see the value of the variable number. And now when I run the code, it's going to show the same thing, but also I see the value of the number variable. So that, that's useful. What people end up doing is going back and forth and figuring out that maybe they put the print statements in the wrong location and then they move them around and they put them in a different location and maybe they decide to expose different variables. So, so I, I have uh, mixed feelings about this, uh, this method. You know, I think that the, on one hand, it's very beautiful and on the other hand, it's very ugly. Uh, the, the, the ugly part is because it is so manual. You have to go manually and put these print statements one by one. You have to decide where you want to put them in advance. You have to decide in advance which variables to expose. And then you have to run them run the code and see that the, the print, the text you saw printed wasn't exactly what you expected. So you go in and you put the prints in a different place and you try to run, run it again. And if you're working on a big complicated project, this running again is, um, is annoying because you, there could be a long build process and it could take you a long time to reach the state that uh, reproduces your bug. So, so this is so that's why it's ugly. So it's very annoying to do this back and forth of adding print statements. But uh, it is also a beautiful method. And what's beautiful about it is that it just always works. Uh, I said earlier how it is so difficult to set up a debugger in a corporate environment because it's running on a different machine and you have to do remote debugging and connect to it and set up maybe an SSH tunnel. And that's such a drag. But print statements or log statements, which are the same or writing a file, that just always works. It's very, very reliable, which is why people have used it for many decades. So I said that was, I've spoken about the classic debugger and I've spoken about why people use print statements and log statements for debugging. So now I'm gonna explain how PySnooper is a compromise between the two. So I developed PySnooper in a year and a half ago when I was frustrated with the, with the current state of debugging. And, and I thought maybe it's possible to do a, a compromise, something that, is, something that is easy and reliable like a print statement, even in complicated setups, but it gives more information similar to a debugger. So that's what PySnooper is. Let me, let me sh demonstrate to you how, how I use it. I'm gonna delete the print statements and I'm gonna import PySnooper and I'm gonna do a PySnooper.snoop, right? Just added a decorator to my function. And now when I run, when I run the, the file, I get this, okay? And um, what, what is this? This is a huge text dump showing everything that happened in the, in the function. Now, at the end, there is the same output that there was before, 110, that's the output of my code. Um, but we've got all this text, and this text is sort of an, an automatic log of what happened in, in the file. So like if we read it, we see at the beginning, it tells us which source file is running and then the starting value of the variable number. And then it just goes over each and every line of code saying this line ran, now this line ran, now this line ran. Now this is a new variable that got declared. Each and every line, just it just prints exactly what happened. And every time a, a variable got modified, it prints the new va value of that variable. So it's sort of an automatic way of saying, just put prints everywhere, exposing everywhere. 
you get a huge dump of text and then you could put it in a text file. You can grab through it, you can search, you can analyze it and you can use it to figure out what's going on in your code. So that's, that, that's basically what Python for does. That's the most simple usage. Uh, it has lots of advanced features. You, you can mostly read about them on the GitHub page. There is a, when you go into the GitHub page, there is a list of features. There is an advanced usage page where you can see the documentation for everything. But I'm gonna show you like the, maybe three features that are important. Okay, so when I decorate with Snoop, I've got a bunch of arguments. You can explore all of these arguments, but I'm gonna show you just the most important ones. The first one is I can give it, I can tell it to write to a file instead of writing to standard output, right? So that's useful if the code is not running on the shell. You can give it a file, you can give it a logger, you can give it any callable that processes a, a stream of text. So that's one thing that's useful. Another thing that's useful is you can set up watch expressions, just like a debugger. So I can say, please watch the len of bits. All right, there is a list called bits. I want to get a watch on the length of it at, at each point. Let's now run the code. I ran it again, it looks the same, but there is something else. Every time the length of the bits list changes, we're gonna get an entry for it, right? Uh, for example, here the length changes. So now it, it tells us that the new length of the list bits is one. So we can put any kind of Python expression in that watch list and it's gonna watch it for us and it's gonna report to us every time it changes. So that's another useful thing. <coughs> um, an another useful parameter, and this one I, can I cannot demonstrate in this example, but I will just talk about is depth. By default, depth equals one, which means that PySnooper uh, gives you output for every line that runs in your function. But if you do depth equals two, it's gonna give you output for every line that is run by a function that is run by your function, right? It goes two levels deep. If you type in three, it's gonna go three levels deep. You can really quickly, like if you could type in four or five, it can be a huge text dump. Um, so I found that very useful. I mean, I've often just done it like a thousand, a depth thousand just to see everything. And that, that was pretty cool. The text dump was huge, but I was able to search through it. And the deeper parts are indented. So it's easy to see when it goes deeper and when it goes back uh, to, the, to the previous uh, stack frames. So these are a bunch of features. There are more features that you can see on the GitHub page and advanced usage. Okay, so I've spoken about uh, how to use PySoper to debug your code. Now I have two more things I want to talk about. And I remind you, if you have questions, feel free to ask them in the chat and I will, I will speak about whatever you want. Uh, okay, so the next item is, um, let's talk about making a popular open source project. So I, po I uh, created by Snooper a year and a half ago, and it's gotten real popular. I posted it on a Hacker News and on Reddit. I got lots of upvotes and, and it kind of went viral. And that's why it has uh, 13,000 stars, lots of almost a thousand forks. Lots of people watch it, lots of people contributed to it. So, I mean, it's been pretty, pretty amazing. I, I was very happy when, happy when that happened. Um, and I, I'm, I'm just, I know that lots of people are interested in open source and making their own popular projects. So I'm just gonna share whatever I can um, to maybe help you make your own projects more successful. So the most important thing that people from the open source world, world uh, forget is the marketing. If you want to make your open source project successful, you really have to make it enticing and easy for people to understand what it's about. So, so the GitHub page is pretty much the homepage of your project. So it's important that when people visit it, they really get very quickly an impression of what's going on. So for me, I have this tagline here saying, never use print for debugging again, which basically lets you know what, what the project is about. And there, there is a readme. The readme is so important because that's like your homepage. This readme is actually longer than what you would usually want. But here I have an explanation of what PySnooper is and what is the pain point that it's solving. 
And, the, and a very important par part of the readme is the example. You gotta, you gotta give an example of usage, a quick start as soon as possible. And the example I've shown here is the same thing I've just shown to you. It's really, it's really important to put that out there. The thing that you have to remember when you're writing a readme for your uh, open source project is that people are impatient and then they're, they're very busy. They have maybe 30 seconds, they will look around at your page and they will see if, if it's interesting, they will, they will find out more. If not, they will leave it. So it's your job to get that information to them front and center so they can make a decision. So, so much of the success of your project is going to, de to be determined by how good your readme is. And the next thing you want to do is you want to post to Hacker News and to Reddit. Let's see the threads. Okay, so I posted to Hacker News. It got lots of points. You can see it's a year, a year and a bit ago, a year and a half. Uh, you should post to Hacker News to Reddit and to uh, get a few of your friends to upvote. It doesn't always help, but give it a try. And if it reaches the front page for even just a little tiny bit, then more people are going to see it and more people are going to upvote it and then it can go viral. And what happened for me with PySnooper is so many people that came from Hacker News started that it got on the GitHub trending page. GitHub has a page called Trending, which shows the re repos that have the most stars today. And once so many people start the, the project, it got on the trending page. And because it was on the trending page, more people saw it on the trending page so they clicked it and started again. So it was another uh, viral cycle. So, so just kept on going. And then people saw it there and, and tweeted about it and then retweeted and, and David Beasley tw tweeted about it and then it blew up. So when it starts to become viral, things just happen by themselves. And your only responsibility is to make it enticing, make a nice readme and post it at a bunch of places at the same time. So that, that's the advice I have to give to you uh, to make your open source project popular. I see, let's see if there are questions. There are no questions yet. Feel free to feel free to ask questions in the chat if you're interested. And and the last thing I'm gonna talk about, or you know what, b before I talk about PUDB, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about how PySnooper works. So that's something that people ask me. Uh, people ask me, what is this magic that lets PySnooper output or make an automatic log of your function? How does it know which line is running? How can it tell when the variables got changed? So I'm going to show you this magic. I'm going to step into PySnooper code right now. Oops. Okay. Now I'm stepping into PySnooper code. By the way, feel free to dive into this code on the GitHub page if you want to implement features or fix bugs. I'll be happy to have you as a contributor. Oh, you know what I should say if, even, well, uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to talk about the contributors later. Anyway, so this is PySnooper code and there is lots of code here, and lots of, lots of documentation, lots of details. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about the whole thing. I'm just going to talk about the very heart of the program. And that's sys.setTrace. And here is the line. This is the magic line that makes everything happen. This is the line in PySnooper that, that, is, that makes it work. sys.setTrace is something that comes with Python. And it is a tool for you to, to, to add a trace function. It basically tells Python, please use this function I wrote, in my case, self.trace, to uh, as a trace function, which means please call it every time you run a Python line with the full information on which line ran and what is the, the, the current stack frame. And in this function, I, I get the arguments of the frame and the event and the arg. And then I use my own logic. To, to, to do what I want, which is to print information about the line in the trend. Now this, this sys.setrace trick, this is basically how any debugger is written and how any code coverage tool is written, right? If, if you use coverage tools like coverage.py, which tells you which lines of your code ran, they use the same trick I did. They use the same sys.setrace, except they have different logic in their trace function. Their logic is look at the lines, the trend and and update them in our database of lines that ran and lines that did not run. And for a debugger, the logic is going to be different. The logic in the trace function is going to be, look at the line that ran. Is it line 78 of file foo.py? If, if, it, if, it, if it is a breakpoint, please break. If it is not a breakpoint, please don't break. And um, so it, it, 
you, you just put the logic that you want in your trace function. You can you can make a debugging tool just like I did. So that's it about how PyStalker is made. And I'm just gonna say a couple of things about cont contributors. So I posted PySnooper a year and a half ago and I got a bunch of contributors. And the most prolific one was uh, Alex Hall. He wrote a lot of code and he also reviewed a lot of other people's code and, and reviewed also uh, also reviewed uh, my code and other people's code and it was very helpful. Uh, so he so he contributed a lot and, and lots of other people wrote code, wrote pull requests, uh, reported issues. Okay, so if if we look at the pull requests, lots of lots of people, lots of people made pull requests, and we and we reviewed them. Alex did lots of work reviewing them, and we added more features and fixed more bugs. I, I am careful not to add too many features because I, I like to keep it as a as a cute little toy. I don't want it to get to be a complicated debugger. Okay, so enough about PySnooper, and now for something completely different. I'm going to talk about PUDB. PUDB is a different tool, but it is also a debugging tool, and I think it's worth to know about it. Um, here I have the same file I've had before, I've shown it before, the same number two bits function. And I'm gonna use the PUDB tool. And use it like this, PUDB, foo.py. Now many people know PDB. I hate PDB so much, it is so annoying. PUDB is a sort of graphical version of that. Um, and it's, it's kind of like a graphical debugger in your shell. So it is very useful when you are debugging something on a computer where you only have SSH access. Okay, so you can now see the interface. It's, it's pretty crazy. I mean, I can, I mean, I just, I can use it like, as if it was a debugger like PyCharm, but it's in the SSH session. So it's pretty amazing. Um, I can set breakpoints, uh, I can, I can step through the code, I can do next, I can step in, step out, I can even open a shell. It's a little slow because it's running on my Raspberry Pi. So I'll give it a few seconds. I can open a shell and I can see the value of variables. And I can I can run any any Python code right inside the process that is being debugged. Um, I, I, can, I can make it basically do anything, most anything I can do in, in a real debugger. And it, it, the fact that it runs inside the shell with a graphic interface, that's the really amazing part. Uh, the most difficult part of, of working with this uh, tool is that it has keyboard bindings and you have to learn them. You can't use the mouse, as far as I know. So you, 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 if you press question mark, you see the list of all, of all the keyboard bindings and how to use them. So it, it takes a while to learn how to use them. And th this tool is, is also, it's not as powerful as PyCharm. I don't think it has multi-processing support or, or anything, but it works. It's a cute little tool and it's worth uh, to know it for these times when you do need it. Uh, so that's been PUDB. And I think, I think, um, I think I'm done. Uh, are there any questions? Does anyone have any questions? 10 minutes left, oh, that, that was a while ago. Okay, otherwise I think I'm done. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Uh, please, uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you very much, Ramsam, Mr. Ram. Yeah, I I also still using print debug, print and the logging. So this, this presentation gave me a lot of Motivate, motivate to use Pi Snooper. Pi Snooper. Happy to hear that. Yeah, and uh, I also I agree with you because README that on on the GitHub README is very very important to like uh, for for beginners for for users. First of all, just first of all check the README and uh, check the, the there is a really really written on the how to how to use if the explanation is really simple and good it the change change mind and uh, okay let's start let's start using it yeah awesome yeah 
Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing, Yosuke. Thank you very much. So All right. anybody, some questions? If, if you have any questions, please raise your hand or please write down your questions on the chat, chat board. We have six minutes left. No one have no one has questions. Mm. Okay, uh, I'll be on the Slack. If anyone's gonna have questions, feel free to to send me messages on this on this Slack. And I'm happy to finish early. I guess I got all my points across. Okay, thank you very much. Right. Have yeah. a good day, everybody. Have a good conference. It's a little bit earlier, but uh, the press the talk is talk is over. <laughs>